competitive competitive researchers and clinicians. So Peter, we're truly delighted. And we will start in September 17 uh, with another uh, superstar from Hopkins, uh, will be King Wai Yao. Uh, so uh, we send you an email and reminder and everything else. Um, I think King is going to be in person and uh, in the next few months, we will try to set it up for a hybrid system that you still will be able to attend via uh, Zoom. Uh, to watch our lectures. Uh, I would be amiss to really thank uh, two people today as the final lecture is uh, Diana and Dr. Falceska. They really did all of the work and, and were phenomenal with recruiting speakers and uh, doing everything to prepare for those lectures. Uh, so right now, um, the challenge for me will be to negotiate with Grazina to continue uh, next year and we will see how that goes. Uh, since she has a little bit more power than I, so I don't know, uh, maybe with some help, uh, we will be able to manage to convince her to continue with this series. Um, with that, I would like to uh, again remind you that in November we have Bob Lefkowitz. Uh, uh, he is uh, leading history of uh, modern pharmacology in the country, so I'm truly delighted to have him. Um, I work with Bob few, uh, on a few projects. Uh, he still thinks I'm his student. So uh, that's a wonderful feeling, I would say. Uh, with that, I would like to move to a formal presentation by our superstar, Jennings Lu. All righty. Uh, good morning, everybody. My name is Jennings Lu, and I'm a senior MD, PhD graduate fellow from Dr. Palchewski's lab. Today, it's my distinct pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, the director of the Retinal Cell and Molecular Laboratory at the Wilmer Eye Institute and professor of ophthalmology and neuroscience at the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. He earned his Bachelor of Science from the University of Notre Dame prior to obtaining his medical degree from the Johns Hopkins School of Medicine. He then completed his residency training in ophthalmology at the University of Virginia and subsequently, he completed a vitreal retinal fellowship along with research fellowships in retinal neurochemistry and diseases at Johns Hopkins University. As a clinician scientist, his research is directed at understanding the pathogenesis of ocular neovascularization and excessive retinal vascular permeability and the mechanism of cone cell death in inherited retinal degenerations. His work provided the first evidence of the role of VEGF in driving choroidal neovascularization, which culminated in establishing anti-VEGF therapies as the standard of care for treating diabetic macular edema, retinal vein occlusion, and choroidal neovascularization seen in age-related macular degeneration. Today, we have the privilege of hearing about his latest work on the mechanisms of cone cell death and retinitis pig pigmentosa. So without further ado, closing out our ophthalmology research seminar series for this academic year, Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you Dr. Peter Campociaro. Thank you for that very kind in the, uh, um, introduction, uh, Jennings. And it's a great pleasure to talk to all my friends at, at UCI. Uh, these are my disclosures. None of the disclosures are relevant to this presentation, but I have uh, a lot of other disclosures. So I know all of you are very well aware of uh, the clinical aspects of retinitis pigmentosa, but it's a very uh, unusual uh, disease because it's caused by multiple mutations in many different genes. And the things that, that those genes have in common is that they differentially affect rod photoreceptors versus cone photoreceptors. The mutations cause um, the degeneration of rods uh, and the cones are largely spared, but after the rods degenerate, uh, there's then gradual degeneration of the cones. And it's the degeneration of the cones that is most clinically significant. Uh, the rod degeneration, you know, causes patients to have difficulty in dim illumination, often referred to as night blindness. But it's the cone degeneration that causes the gradual constriction of the visual fields and ultimately uh, blindness. The, the phenotype, uh, in general, shows a, a picture of pigmentary changes throughout the periphery, but this is not always the case. It can be quite variable. And the OCT is generally more helpful because the SDOCT shows the 
ellipsoid zone, the EZ, which essentially corresponds to the remaining cones that have intact inner and outer segments. And so it, is, it can provide an assessment of the severity of the cone degeneration. Now these two OCTs, the bottom one shows a very short EZ width. So this is a patient with very advanced RP compared to this patient who has moderately advanced uh, RP. Now the rod photo photoreceptors constitute 95% of the cells in the outer retina. And they're very metabolically active. Their inner segments are packed with mitochondria. So they consume a great deal of oxygen. And the choroid does not have autoregulation. So after the rods degenerate, one would anticipate that uh, the, the consumption of oxygen has gone way down. And since the delivery doesn't change that the level of oxygen in the outer retina would go up. And this was essentially proven by you and associates using oxygen electrodes in which they compared the oxygen levels in the retina in wild type rats versus RCS rats. In wild type rats, with the electrodes positioned so that they're measuring in the choroid, the level of oxygen is very high. And as the electrode is withdrawn, you see this precipitous drop in oxygen level that corresponds to the region of the photoreceptor inner segments. In RCS rats, the, uh, the curve is very similar in very young rats prior to rod degeneration. But after the rods have degenerated, there's no longer this drop in oxygen level uh, so that the remaining cones are exposed to very high levels of oxygen. And high levels of oxygen kill photoreceptor cells. This is shown in these wild type mice who were exposed to 75% oxygen for three weeks. Compared to mice that were uh, reared in room air, you see that the outer nuclear layer is very thin posteriorly compared to the, the room air exposed mice, uh, but not so much in the periphery. And this is because the the blood flow in the choroid is much greater posteriorly than anteriorly, resulting in very high levels of oxygen posteriorly. And this results in oxidative damage and the gradual death of the photoreceptors. Now, oxidative damage causes very distinctive changes in macromolecules. Uh, in in uh, lipids, it causes the production of acrolein and 4 hydroxynone now. In proteins, it causes carbonyl addicts on the proteins, as well as the production of 3-nitrotyrosine. And in DNA, it causes the production of 8-hydroxy-2-deoxyguanosine. Now, these, um, these agents are essentially like fingerprints at a crime scene. So when you identify these in a particular tissue, you can be confident that oxidative damage has occurred. Jiqui Shen, um, wanted to determine if there was evidence of oxidative damage in a pig model of retinitis pigmentosa that was generated by Bob Petters and Fulton Wong. In that model, uh, they transgenically expressed a mutant rhodopsin uh, that caused degeneration of rods. And so this is essentially like a autosomal dominant model of retinitis pigmentosa. The rods pretty much completely degenerate by nine months and at that point, there's no cone degeneration, but gradually uh, there, the cones degenerate. So at 20 months, it's quite advanced. Now in wild type pigs, this shows staining of, of acrolein. And you can see that there's mild staining in the inner segments in, in normal pigs. And this indicates that there's very mild oxidative damage, which is handled by reparative mechanisms uh, in turnover. Uh, but in the transgenic pigs at 10 months, you see that there's very bright staining for acrolein. And uh, over time, you see that the remaining cones become disorganized and that the staining spreads uh, to the cell bodies. So there's progressive oxidative damage. This is a confocal image that shows the cones lighting up for acrolein. 
and then the progressive staining that occurs over time. And the findings are very similar for nitrotyrosine uh, and for 8-hydroxydeoxyguanosine. Uh, so there's, there's um, evidence of oxidative damage that occurs in the cones after the rods have degenerated that's progressive uh, in lipids, proteins, and DNA. A Kiichi Kumima um, wanted to determine the impact of reducing oxidative stress in a model of retinitis pigmentosa, the RD1 mouse, in which there's a nonsense mutation in the beta subunit of phosphodiesterase. This shows staining for peanut agglutinin, which stains cone matrix sheaths in a wild type mouse at P21. And you see that the cone inner and outer segments are intact and there's a thick outer nuclear layer. In a P21 RD1 mouse, where essentially almost all of the rods are degenerated by P21, see that the outer nuclear layer is reduced to a single layer of cones, and the cones have no outer segments and flattened inner segments. Now, in order to measure, to quantitate the cone density, um, it's necessary to measure in the same exact location in, in all animals because the degeneration of the cones is not homogeneous. It occurs in a gradient starting centrally and then progressing post uh, uh, anterior. So Keiichi selected four bins to measure, one in each of the four quadrants of the, of the ret. And the, the quantitation is done on flat mounts. And this shows retinal flat mounts in wild type and RD1 mice at P21 stained with PNA. And like with the sections, you see in the wild type mice, there are intact inner and outer segments. But in the RD1 um, mice, you see that the outer segments are, of the cones are gone and the inner segments are flattened. But the density is fairly similar. And when you quantitate that, you see that at P21, the cell density is the same in wild type as in RD1 mice. But over the subsequent two weeks in the RD retina, the cone density drops by 80%. There's a little difference among the various quadrants, but essentially this window provides you with uh, an excellent opportunity to measure the impact of a therapeutic uh, agent in a relatively short period of time. So Keiichi selected a, a mixture of antioxidants based on the literature. And with that mixture, he first wanted to determine, is he, was he able to reduce the oxidative damage in RD1 mice? And so he treated mice with either vehicle or with the mixture of antioxidants and stained for acrolein. You can see at P30 in the vehicle treated mice, there's strong staining for acrolein. But in the mice treated with the antioxidants, that staining is markedly reduced. So he was able to reduce the oxidative damage that was occurring in the RD1 mice. And that was associated with a marked improvement in cone survival. This again shows the, the flat mounts at P21 and RD1 mice. And then they were treated between P21 and P35 with the mixture of antioxidants or with vehicles. And you can see that there is some reduction in cone density in the antioxidant-treated uh, uh, animals. But in each of the quadrants, the density is significantly greater than in the vehicle-treated mice. And this shows the quantitation. Now, he also demonstrated that this occurred in other models of RP. The Q344 tear mice, which express a mutant rhodopsin, so it's an autosomal dominant model of RP. And RD10 mice, which also have a different mutation in rod phosphodiesterase that causes a slower degeneration of rods. And in this model in which the rod degeneration is slower, you see a greater effect in terms of cone rescue. And you even see a transient um, effect on the rod survival as shown by these outer nuclear layer uh, spider plots. At P25, there's significantly thicker outer nuclear layers uh, than in the um, vehicle-treated mice. But 
But this is transient because at P35, that benefit is almost completely eliminated. So this, this suggests that as rods are dying from the, the mutation, they, they also are exposed to an increase in oxidative stress, which, which uh, increases the rapidity of their demise, but it doesn't ultimately uh, affect it as they die from the mutation-induced cell death. Now, how does hyperoxia lead to uh, increase in reactive oxygen species? Well, the literature, uh, based mostly on studies in lung-induced hyperoxia, uh, suggests that the hyperoxia causes increased uh, tissue levels of oxygen that pair improperly with uh, the early components of, of electron transport chain to produce superoxide radicals. Sinichi Yusiu wanted to know, is there also production of superoxide radicals in the cytoplasm? And there's two enzymes that are present in most cells that are capable of producing superoxide, NADPH oxidase and xanthine oxidase. And you can visualize superoxide by administering hydroxyethidine, um, which in the presence of superoxide, forms a phidium, which binds to DNA and fluoresces. So in P14 RD1 mice, you see that there's prominent staining for, um, with the hydroxyethidine or the ethidium, uh, indicating superoxide radicals in cones. Uh, and if you treat with vehicle, you see again, a lot of superoxide radicals, but if you treat with the NADPH oxidase inhibitor, apocyanine, this is substantially reduced. And that reduction in superoxide ra radicals results in greater survival of cones. Now, there's many other studies that uh, we did that I don't have time to uh, go over, but this schematic basically shows you uh, what they demonstrate. That you know, after rods degenerate, there's increased level of oxygen in the outer retina. And this results in the production of superoxide radicals in mitochondria and um, in, in the cytoplasm because of stimulation of NADPH oxidase. I mentioned, I forgot to mention that we also looked at inhibitors of xanthine oxidase and they had no effect. Now these superoxide radicals then react with other uh, things to create other reactive oxygen species. And the high levels of nitric oxide in the, in the retina are particularly problematic because superoxide reacts with nitric oxide to produce peroxynitrate, which is particularly reactive and very difficult to de detoxify. So these superoxide radicals then cause damage to macromolecules in cones. And over time, that results in a gradual cone cell death. Now, n acetyl cysteine is a, is a derivative of L-cysteine that detoxifies reactive oxygen species itself, but it's also a, a substrate for glutathione, which is a major component of the endogenous antioxidant defense system. Um, NAC is approved for acetaminophen over overdose. When someone ingests a lot of acetaminophen, it's, it's metabolized in the liver and produces um, aldehydes and other reactive oxygen species that cause severe oxidative damage and hepatic necrosis. But when NAC is given in a timely fashion, it reduces that oxidative damage and is life-saving. Sunny Lee tested oral uh, NAC in, patient, in uh, RD10 mice and found a dose-dependent improvement in cone survival uh, and also cone function um, as demonstrated by photopic ERG B-wave amplitudes. This led to the fight RP uh, study in which oral NAC uh, was tested in a dose escalation trial in 30 patients with retinitis pigmentosa. And there were three cohorts of 10 patients each. The first cohort received 600 milligrams BID of NAC for 12 weeks and then TID for 12 weeks, and then were observed for another 12 weeks off medication. 
cohort two got 1200 milligrams BID for 12 weeks, then 1200 milligrams TID for 12 weeks, and cohort three got 1800 milligrams BID for 12 weeks, then 1800 milligrams TID for 12 weeks. There were 11 uh, drug-related adverse events during that 24-week treatment period, and nine of them were related to the gastrointestinal tract. Eight of them were very mild and resolved spontaneously. Three were moderate and occurred when the switch occurred from BID to TID dosing, and then with de-escalation to BID dosing, they resolved. So with this, we determined that 1800 milligrams BID was well tolerated and was the maximum uh, tolerated dose. Now with these doses of oral NAC, uh, there was good uh, intraocular levels. We did serial uh, anterior chamber taps and measured NAC. And in, the, in cohort one, the mean uh, aqueous level of NAC was in the range of about 100 nanograms per mil. In cohorts two and three, it was in the range of about 300 nanograms per mil. We also me measured NAC in plasma. We did that at baseline at the week 12 and week 24 visits. At baseline, we measured it prior to administration of the first dose of NAC, and then at one hours and two hours after drug administration. Um, at the week 12 and week 24 visits, we had the patients hold their their morning dose of NAC, uh, did a level, then administered NAC, and again measured it at one and two levels after drug administration. Now the patients found it burdensome to stick around for that two hour dose and complained a lot about it. So we modified the protocol after the first cohort and just did a one hour post-dose measurement. But what's, what's interesting about this is that the baseline measurements at 12 and uh, 24 were essentially 10 to 14 hours after the last dose. And in all of the cohorts, the NAC was detectable. So that it indicates that uh, with BID dosing, there is coverage with NAC remaining in the plasma around the clock. And so with 1800 milligrams BID, the peak in the trough levels are in the range of 10 nanograms per mil and one to two nanograms per mil. Now, in a subsequent um, extension study, we've demonstrated that this pre-dose uh, level of NAC corresponds or, or correlates fairly well with aqueous NAC. And so moving forward, we can substitute the plasma NAC for uh, measurement of aqueous NAC. Now, these patients had quite good visual acuity. And in cohort one, the baseline visual acuity was 72 ETDRS letters, uh, which corresponds to about 2040. And in, in cohort um, two, it was 74, cohort five, uh, cohort three, 75, and that's about 2032 um, in snow and acuity. So despite this good baseline visual acuity, we saw a progressive gradual improvement in best corrected visual acuity over the 24 week treatment period in all of the cohorts. And this using um, mixed linear models, um, mixed effects models was statistically significant. Now, you know, a random change or, you know, generally occurs going up and down uh, and, you know, but that's why a progressive steady change using this mixed effect model uh, shows that it's unlikely to be due to chance. Now we measured retinal sensitivity using the macular integrity, integrity assessment or MIA microperimeter. It measures sensitivity at 68 loci in the central 30 degrees. And then it calculates the mean macular sensitivity. And just like with best corrected visual acuity, the mean macular sensitivity showed this, this slight improvement, gradual progressive improvement throughout the 24 week period. And this was greatest in cohort three, measuring about 0.15 dB per month 
and that was statistically significant. Now also the change from baseline between baseline and week 24, the mean change from baseline was statistically significant in cohorts two and three. Now the, the change in uh, easy width um, did not occur. There was not any significant change in easy width over the 24 week uh, period, which is good, but it doesn't really mean anything because that's too short a period of time to see an easy width change in untreated patients. Now this is a, uh, a heat map, which is part of the printout uh, from the Maya microperimetry. This is one of the cohort one patients. And the way the heat map works is uh, there's colors that correspond to the level of, of macular sensitivity. And a green shows a high level of sensitivity. The reddish or orange shows a moderate level and the dark gray shows absent, no detectable um, sensitivity. So this patient, this is the best of two baseline uh, microperimetries. And you can see in this patient that this patient has about 20 degrees of sensitivity remaining and, and it's moderate. Now all this area is essentially absolute scotoma. Now, after 12 weeks of treatment with NAC, you see that this region that previously lacked sensitivity now has some sensitivity. And at 24 weeks, it's expanded a bit. And now you begin to see some increase in the central sensitivity. And then 12 weeks after stopping NAC, much of this is maintained, although there is partial regression. Now, this is the same patient with the fundus image and the sensitivity at each locus uh, superimposed on the image. Now, the, it's too small to see what the, the actual numbers are, but these uh, circles show uh, the, the loci in which there was an improvement of 6 dB or more during the treatment period. And 6 dB is useful because the test-retest variability is about 4 dB, and 6 dB is about two standard deviations above that level. And so a change of 6 dB is unlikely to be due to chance. And the yellow circles um, show the, the loci that undergo a change. When they hit the threshold of 6 dB, the circles turn green. And if they go back below that threshold, it turns yellow. So in this patient, you see that there's a large number of loci that improved by 6 dB. And it's a fairly rapid improvement because most of them have improved by 12 weeks of treatment. Now, after in the next 12 weeks, many of them maintain that threshold, some regress, but then 12 weeks after treatment, there's still some of these loci that are above the six dB threshold. Now, it's interestingly, this patient's NAC level was substantially above the mean uh, for, mo for a cohort one. Here's a patient from cohort two, and this is the best of two baseline um, microperimeters. And you see that this patient has quite good sensitivity centrally, has almost uh, 30 degrees of field remaining, uh, or has at least 30 degrees, but with this area that is scotomatous. Now, after 12 weeks of NAC, you see that these scotoma are reduced somewhat and further reduced after another, 20, another 12 weeks. And much of that is maintained 12 weeks after stopping NAC. Now, this patient also had many loci that improved by 6 dB or more, but it was gradual. You see that only one uh, hit the threshold by uh, 12 weeks, but then almost all by 24 weeks but then many regressed below that 6 dB threshold after stopping NAC. Now here's the uh, cohort three patient, the best of two baseline um, readings. You see that uh, there's moderate uh, sensitivity throughout 30 degrees, but there's this area of an arcuate scotoma and some scotoma over here. After 12 weeks of NAC, you see some reduction in the scotomas, further reduction, at 24 weeks, and then regression after stopping NAC. 
This patient had many loci that improved by 6 dB or more. You see most of them by 12 weeks of treatment and maintained at 24 and then regressed after stopping NAP. Now this cohort three patient has really pretty good sensitivity at baseline. Sensitivity throughout 30 degrees and an increased sensitivity centrally. You see that in this patient that this area of, of high sensitivity expands after 24 weeks of NAC and uh, much of it is maintained after stopping NAC. And this patient shows several loci that improved by 6 dB or more, uh, not much at 12, but then the th they hit threshold at 24, and some of them are maintained after stopping NAC. Xiaogrong Kong uh, did a locus level sensitivity analysis of these data. Uh, in this analysis, she essentially looked at each loci individually and looked at the change in sensitivity over time um, and you know, compared it to baseline characteristics. So this graph shows the change, the, the uh, percentage of loci that lost 60 dB or, or more throughout the treatment period uh, based on their baseline uh, sensitivity. So, you know, I, I highlighted the ones that improved, but there were also some that decreased during that treatment. And what this shows is that um, there is a, a dose effect for the uh, loci that decreased by 6 dB or more. This is the cohort one, cohort two, and cohort three. And you see that there were a greater percentage of patients who had a 6 dB or more loss um, in or, or the number of loci that a 6 dB loss um, compared to the, the higher doses. And this was statistically significant. And you also notice that particularly for cohort one, uh, it's more likely to lose sensitivity by 6 dB or more if your baseline sensitivity is low. This is the low side with low sensitivity, and these are the highest. Now, interestingly, the low side that gained 6 dB or more, there was also greater percentage uh, in low side with low baseline sensitivity. And this is particularly seen in cohort three. So with the loci with low baseline sensitivity, you see um, a greater percentage that gained 6 dB or more. Uh, so this is, this is particularly interesting. This suggests that loci with low sensitivity have a mixed population of cones, some that may be moribund and unable to respond um, to this particular treatment, and others that are able to respond and able to, you know, and because they have more to gain, may show um, a greater level of improvement. Now, we think of patients with retinitis pigmentosa who have good uh, visual acuity as having fairly good sensitivity uh, in the fovea. But in actual fact, that's not completely true. In this population of patients, you've seen that in the foveal loci, the mean baseline sensitivity was about 20 dB. The normal range is 30 to 33 dB. So these, despite very good visual acuity, these patients have suppression of sensitivity centrally. And the suppression, the, the sensitivity though, decreases as it goes out, uh, the, as more eccentricity, the more decrease. That occurs in normal patients as well. So in the parafoveal loci, which surround the foveal loci, you see that the sensitivity is lower. And in the perifoveal loci, which are furthest out, it's even lower. And what was interesting was that the percentage of loci gaining 6 dB or more were much greater centrally, so that with more eccentricity, it became less likely to gain 6 dB or more. And this difference between these two central areas compared to parafobial was, was uh, statistically significant. So this, this suggests that the foveal cones may be somewhat protected from getting to that moribund state, uh, which is you know, potentially clinically significant. 
So in conclusion, in animal models of retinitis pigmentosa, after the rods degenerate, the cones are exposed to high levels of oxidative stress, and that contributes to loss of cone function and cone degeneration. Uh, oral NAC in models of RP reduces the oxidative stress, promotes cone survival and function. In patients with RP, oral NAC is well tolerated, and we found a maximum tolerated dose of 1800 milligrams twice a day, and that results in good intraocular levels. And we showed evidence of improved visual function over a six month treatment period. Based upon that, we hypothesize that long term treatment with NAC could potentially promote cone survival uh, and function and re uh, reduce visual disability in RP. So, because of that, we're now in the planning stages of a multi center randomized placebo con controlled trial. And we hope to test this hypothesis using that trial. I'd like to recognize the investigators in my laboratory who participated in this research, Fulton Wong and Bob Petters, who helped to provide the, the sections from the transgenic pigs, and then our clinical trial group who performed the Fight RP trial. Thank you very much. Thank you, Peter, so much. Uh, we, we have time for questions, so please uh, send me a quick note uh, by chat if you have a question. Let's start with uh, John Hunk. Hello, thank you for a wonderful presentation. I have a quick question. Uh, I was wondering, um, why does the absence of rods lead to oxidative cell death of cones, and why does that not happen with the rods? present. Um, it seems as if it may, may also happen, could, could also happen with the rod being there, but why does the absence of it lead to the oxidative cell death? So the rods constitute 95% of the cells in the outer retina, <clears throat> and they're consuming a lot of oxygen. When the rods degenerate from the mutation, now you're, you have only 5% of the cells that are normally present in the uh, outer nuclear layer. And so because of that, the oxygen consumption has gone way, way down. And unlike the retinal circulation, the choroidal circulation does not auto circulate, does not auto um, regulate. So the, the amount of oxygen that's provided to the outer retina is the same, but the amount that's consumed is much less. And that results in very high oxygen levels. And that's what's been demonstrated experimentally by those experiments by you and associates that I showed you. He, he demonstrated that after the rods degenerate, the level of oxygen that the cones are exposed to is extremely high. It's essentially choroidal levels. And that high level of oxygen causes the production of reactive oxygen species, both in the mitochondria and in the cytoplasm. And those reactive oxygen species result in the progressive oxidative damage to cones. Now you can also use things that, you know, drugs and things like paraquat, which generate superoxide radicals. You can administer those to wild type mice. Now you get superoxide radicals in both rods and cones and you get degeneration of both. Thank you. Uh, that, thank you for your answer. Uh, great presentation. <laughs> UN, UN. Uh, very nice talk and really educating to me uh, as well. I have a question regarding to uh, your uh, clinical trial. Have you looked at the RP patient's rod function after antioxidant treatment? No, we haven't. These, these patients have essentially no rod function. These are fairly advanced patients uh, in this trial, and all of them have extinguished rod ERG and, you know, really very little rod function. Thank you. I also have a, a question related to mitochondrial morphology. Have you take a look at uh, any mouse model of the mitochondria in RPE and in cones in your RP model after treatment? No, we haven't. Thank you. All right, let's move uh, to Chairman Greg. 
Chris. That was a beautiful talk. Um, I have sort of three questions, two very specific and one kind of broad. Um, the, the two specific questions are, um, when you administered NAC, specifically in mice, did you look at um, glutathione levels? Um, and additionally, did you look at acrolein staining with the NAC treated? Yes. So um, we have not, we did not in that, those particular experiments look at glutathione levels. We have, however, looked at glutathione levels um, and see an increase in glutathione with administration of NAC. Um, we've looked at a number of markers of oxidative damage, including um, carbonyl content on proteins as measured quantitatively by uh, ELISA, as well as staining for acrolein. And you see a, a, a marked reduction with NAC uh, administration in RD models. And, and so my broad question is kind of getting a mechanism of how NAC could be working. So, you know, if, if you look at acrolein and also 4 hydroxy now, those are very effective microacceptors, and NAC is like a perfect molecule to react with those. And so I guess my question, my broad question is, have you contemplated a mechanism whereby NAC is effectively acting as a for lack of a better word, a buffer that's reacting with acrolein and 4-HNE and preventing it from being toxic within, um, within the tissue? Yeah, that's basically part of our model is that we think that, you know, the NAC um, helps to detoxify all of the reaction option species. I mean, not only superoxide, but the downstream ones as well. Uh, and, you know, acts by both direct interaction is your suggestion, but also the, the production of additional glutathione, uh, which also helps to uh, reduce the damage from those reactive oxygen species. So, you know, naturally in our experiments, we're, we're um, benefited by the fact that we can start the process prior to the real onset of the oxidative stress. Um, and so we, we get the, the benefit of, of acting upstream as the reactive oxygen species are produced. But in the patient setting, of course, this is an ongoing process. And you've got, I mean, not only uh, superoxide, but you've got all sorts of, of uh, reactive oxygen species from the cascade. Uh, and so you've got to detoxify, um, you know, the whole range of reactive oxygen species. Right. Thank you very much. It was a beautiful talk. All right, let's move to Brian Jones. Hey, Peter. Really compelling stuff. Um, Greg sort of zeked my glutathione question, um, but let me uh, let me ask a broader question. So, um, how soon do you think you could initiate treatment in patients with RP? Because by the time you've lost a lot of the rods and you're seeing impacts to cones things are pretty far along the way uh, in terms of remodeling processes. So, I mean, do you think you could push NAC treatment earlier when people first get diagnosed with RP? Um, how, what are your thoughts there? So that's a, that's a really good question. And it has really two, two components to the answer. First, in order to demonstrate whether or not NAC truly has benefit, we need to find a population of patients in which the rate of degeneration is sufficiently fast so that we can uh, measure it experimentally. And we have to have a good outcome measure for assessment. So we think we've settled on um, a group. And actually, in this particular clinical trial, one of the things that we learned was that uh, if patients are very far advanced, um, it's very difficult to make an impact. And we think the sweet spot is with an easy width greater than 1,500 and less than 6,000. Mm -hmm. With that, in that range, uh, the natural history is such that there's a, a fairly rapid reduction in, in, and by fairly rapid, I mean over the course of years, but 
essentially about 100 um, microns or more per year, depending upon the genotype. And that's a range where we think within a four year window, we would be able to see a 30% treatment effect with NAC. So that's the first target population. But as you point out, you know, for clinical care, you would want to intervene as early as possible. Now we're going to limit, because of the usual constraints of clinical trials, limit our population to 18 and older. Um, but if it's demonstrated to be useful, this would probably be a lifelong treatment that you would start right. very early on in the process. Right. Are you still continuing on with large eye models? With what? Large eye models of RP? No, I mean, we're, we're now focused on the clinical trials. I mean, it, it, would, it would be interesting, at least from a, from a histological standpoint, there, there's, there's a lot of analysis you could do if there were a relatively strong large eye model study uh, in pigs or rabbits um, that you know, we could track intervention with specific cell classes. Yeah, so that's a good uh, um, point. We are proceeding with what we look at as second generation. And I think Steve Fleisler uh, posted a question on chat that's sort of relevant to that, that uh, NAC is really a good proof of concept uh, approach because it, it's an approved drug that has a long history of a good um, toxicity profile. It's really a very safe drug. And you know, oral administration is something that patients readily accept. And I can tell you that the patients who have participated in these trials really have no problem with this. Um, but you know, there, there may be more efficient ways and ways that you can, um, can combine with NAC. We, we look at that as, as a good proof of concept and foundational in which other things can be added. And Steve brought up, would you consider NOx inhibitors? And I think that is a, a, a reasonable uh, approach to, to add on. Um, in addition, you know, some, some approaches in which, you know, you use um, neuroprotective agents and things like that to kind of increase the threshold before uh, apoptosis occurs, you know, would be useful. So we are, you know, continuing uh, animal model work, but not just with NAC alone. All right, let's move to Vice Chair Vladimir. Thank you, Dr. Kampuchiara, wonderful talk. Uh, I was wondering, is there any evidence that autophagy might play a role in the oxidative stress response in COM photoreceptors? Yeah, I think that I, you know, I'm not aware of specific evidence in there, but you know, I think that uh, certainly when organelles such as mitochondria become damaged, uh, autophagy is a way that that's managed. So I'm, I think it's highly likely that there's aut autophagy that's uh, that's going on. Okay, thank you. All right, let's go to almost Dr. Susie Sue. So. <laughs> Uh, hi, Dr. Uh, Kampuchara. Uh, thank you for a wonderful talk. Uh, my question is, um, so, so you mentioned that rods consume a high amount of oxygen. And does, does the, is there any evidence that if the, in the setting of um, the visual cycle impairment where the uh, visual chromophores are not available, does rod oxygen consumption change in that um, that environment? Now that's a good question for Dr. Palczewski. He, he is the visual cycle guru, so I'm gonna deflect that one uh, to him. What do you say, Chris? We have to chat with Susie and she's still waiting for graduation on Wednesday, so I will uh, take that as uh, advisement whether she should pass or not. <laughs> All right, let's move on to Steve Fleisler, the only one. Okay, so hi, Peter, great to see Thanks, you. Steve. I really enjoyed the talk. So you handled one of the 
questions I had uh, posed, which was combined therapy with uh, NOx inhibitors and, um, and NAC. And I think that that has promised, but you'd want to do an animal model uh, uh, test bef before you would do that in, in humans. <clears throat> the other question, though, was about, uh, you know, a lot of time, as you mentioned, your, your patients probably have very good compliance because they're very mo motivated. Um, but I'm thinking, uh, especially for possible uh, GI uh, distress issues, if you could administer a continuous release form of NAC, uh, you could have a lower uh, threshold and, and not even have to worry about compliance. Yeah, I think that's a good idea. Um, we, um, we have partnered with a, a company that has what seems to be a very nice formulation. It's, it's essentially a NAC Alka-Seltzer and it's, it's flavored. Um, some of you may have had some experience with NAC in the past and you know some formulations of NAC are, are very, um, let's say undesirable in that they, you know, it can have an odor and, uh, uh, but this one is really very nice. It's flavored and, you know, just pop it in a glass of water. The nice thing about it too, is that for different doses, you know, it was so easy to manage because you just have different, and you know, it's a certain number of tablets that you pop in a glass of water and then, you know, there it is. So this one, this particular formulation is really well uh, tolerated and accepted. I think it's a good, good for you know initial studies. But you know, as you point out, you know there may be better formulations for down the line and you know a sustained delivery. Although it it really kind of surprised me. And one of the things I forgot to mention with those those intraocular levels that we did that the there was no increase in aqueous levels going from BID to TID. So, um, you, you know, it's, it's the, the current uh, formulations of NAC really provide pretty good levels round the clock, uh, even with BID dosing. Um, but naturally, if you can give something once a day versus twice a day and you have you know, good prolonged sustained delivery, that's, that's uh, beneficial. So that would be something for down the line. Yeah, the issue of uh, metabolite from it, uh, particular tiles, uh, will have a lot of, uh, you know, this undesirable effect, not, not causing any harm, but, uh, you know, we're very sensitive to tiles. And so any small amount that is get degraded is going to cause a little trouble. Maybe it's worth to try it for a few days since it's not toxic. How would you feel to understand the patients better now? Yeah. All right, we have still many, many questions. Uh, so let's go to Henry. Um, thank you, very nice talk. Uh, I just have a quick quick question and uh, if you have insight. Um, where, are, where are these NOx genes um, expressed in the mouse? mouse retinas, you know? So um, they, they're, they're definitely expressed in, in photoreceptors. Uh, the, uh, Al Lewin has done some very nice work uh, on that. And he's actually um, done a, um, created, um, I think with his, it wasn't siRNAs, but I think it was uh, one of his technologies where he knocked down NOx uh, in uh, in photoreceptors, and he sees he sees benefits in various models, um, even diabetic retinopathy. He sees some. So so you know they're they're pretty much ubiquitously expressed. They're they're you know can, the levels can vary, but they're clearly in in photoreceptors. Thank you. Let's go to Daniel Brook. Hi, that was an awesome talk. Um, so antioxidant treatment leads to improved cone survival, but from my takeaway, it looks like the cones still have no outer segments. 
And uh, I was wondering how cones um, survive without, without outer segments and how this leads to improved visual acuity. Um, and how, uh, have you done something like ERGs on patients or mouse models with RP um, after NAC treatment? Yes, so that's a, that's a very good question. And one of the things you have to remember is that um, the models that we look at, like the RD1 and the RD10 mice, are very severe models. You know, we talk about the, the ratio of rods to cones in humans, which is 95% to five. Well, it's like 98% to two in, in the mice. And they, once their rods degenerate, the level of oxidative stress is tremendous. And they don't have an area centralis or, or a, a fovea where, you know, there's a high density of cones. So it's really severe. But we have found that when we use antioxidants and nitric oxide uh, synthase inhibitors, that we can preserve some outer segments. And it's interesting that despite the lack of outer segments, there is ERG signal there and uh, there's, there is some function. So um, it's quite amazing to me, but the cones still function somewhat without outer segments. But the outer, loss of outer segments is particularly problematic because that also um, worsens oxidative stress. It may, brings them closer to the choroid. So we think though that um, one of the things we hope is that treatment, you know, persistent long-term treatment with NAC will result in some outer segment regeneration. And in the trial, we're collaborating with, um, with Jackie Duncan and, and Joe Carroll to try to do some um, adaptive optics to see if we can see any morphologic changes in the cones associated with the treatment. Awesome. So we think that the, the possibility of doing that is much greater in humans in which the degeneration is much slower. There's you know, a macula that has a high density of cones uh, than you would ever have in, in rodents. All right, let's move to another, uh, Dan. Hey, Peter, uh, very nice talk. I, I was curious whether you think treatments like, like NAC will be necessary to really uh, enable gene therapy to be successful. That's a really good question because I'm sure you're aware of, you know, Sam Jacobson's work in which, you know, he's demonstrated that, you know, in some, patients with fairly advanced uh, LCA uh, or other conditions that you can get some temporary improvement in function, but it doesn't really um, eliminate the degeneration. And I think that once you get widespread elimination, uh, elimination of rods, um, you know, it's, you have this ongoing oxidative damage and, and you may have some remaining rods where you get, you know, the, uh, the gene correction and get function, but that is unlikely to eliminate all the, the degeneration that occurs. So yeah, we think that probably this is gonna be something that once you have lost a, a certain critical mass of rods, regardless of gene therapy or other approaches that are taken, that you're gonna need something like this. How about Jim Hall? Yeah, I just had uh, a question about whether uh, this um, antioxidative treatment might be effective in other retinal problems like AMD. Yeah, that's a good question, Jim. I think that uh, one of the problems with AMD is, you know, I think that oxidative stress has been implicated in, you know, a very variety of ways, but there are are many other things that seem to contribute. And uh, I think that the ARID study, you know, clearly showed that, you know, with an approach that really isn't very efficient at reducing oxidative stress, they did see, you know, 
some clinically significant changes in that they, they slowed the rate of progression to advanced AMD. So it's clear that oxidative stress plays some role in that disease process. Um, but, um, you know, I think that's uh, something that needs to be studied in the future. Um, and, you know, maybe if, if we're able to demonstrate um, some efficacy in this disease process, that will, will pick up some momentum for looking at other more complex disease processes like AMD. All right, let's uh, go to three last questions. And then I know you guys all expecting that final comments uh, for entire series of seminars. We have to go to distinguished professor Kathy Bose Rickman. So it has to be. So let's go to Zach first. Hi, that was a great talk. Um, so I had a question about immune cell involvement in the control or response to reactive ox oxygen species. Um, so does that kind of increase, like severe increase in oxygen levels and superoxide production, does that recruit specific immune cell types to the retinal microenvironment? Um, or potentially remodel the immune system's response to that stress? I think it's a good question, but I don't really have an answer for you. We really haven't looked at immune cells. I, I think, you know, that there's uh, been a lot of study of microglia um, in the changes that occur in RP, and clearly there's a lot of migration of microglia into the outer retina, and it's been suggested that they may even begin to participate in the disease yeah, process. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think there's but, like a lot of phenotypic plasticity in many immune cell types like that are resident in the eye, but also infiltrating in the case of damage. So, thank yeah. you. Yep. Okay, let's go to Aisha. Hi, very nice talk. Uh, I have a, like a, a general question or maybe just... I want to understand more. So in this degenerative disease, it looks like first there is a, a rad cells that are dying, and then uh, there is a production of a superoxide uh, species, and that's what is leading to a con to die. Yes. So, so I found it's very interesting because in uh, in diabetic retinopathy we see we don't see any cells that are dying, but yet we see massive uh, 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 superoxide level in the uh, in the eyes, specifically in photoreceptors area, and yet there is no uh, cell death. So you think those two diseases are completely different, or just uh, we don't understand yet? very clearly the mechanism and the event that are happening. Yeah, so I, you know, I don't, I know I've, I'm aware of a lot of the work that has looked at oxidative damage in diabetic retinopathy. Um, I don't know the, what the relative levels are. You know, I've never seen studies that have shown the kind of um, staining for various markers of oxidative damage uh, that uh, in uh, diabetic retinopathy that, that we see in RP. I'm, I would think that the levels of oxidative stress that are focused and, and you know, present in that particular location in the retina in RP are just greater than what you see, that, which is more global in diabetic retinopathy. Okay, thank you. Okay, let's go to Barb. Thank you. Um, great talk, Peter. Uh, really amazing. And I'm really hopeful that this sort of gene agnostic approach will, will help a lot of uh, patients, not just in RP, but also maybe in AMD. Um, I have a question regarding sort of biomarker. I think one of the goals you guys had was to look for changes in aqueous reduced oxidized glutathione ratio. And uh, I was just curious since aqueous taps are obviously not the easiest thing to do, 
whether the changes that you, the correlation that you see between NAC and the aqueous and the plasma, whether you see similar changes in GSH, G, SSG ratios in aqueous versus plasma? That's a really good question. See, Barb, you can tell Barb does her homework because she even comments on, on part of the work that, that I didn't even present today. But in, in our <laughs> well, I'm school, aware of your clinical trial. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, so that's a very, very good point. Um, uh, yeah, so we saw evidence of some reduction in oxidative stress uh, markers in, in the eye uh, in that. We didn't really measure it um, in, in plasma. And, you know, I, I think that um, I'm not sure it would be really relevant. Uh, there have been some studies that uh, have shown that there is increased levels of oxidative stress systemically in patients with retinitis pigmentosa. We ourselves have not seen that. And I'm just a little bit skeptical. I just, you know, it's hard for me to imagine that, you know, the, the increased oxidative stress in the retina uh, affects systemic levels. So I'm not sure, I, I'm just, uh, feel a little skeptical that we could get much in the way of, of useful information that's relevant to, to the eye. But I think your point is to just look at the, you know, you know, the sort of the effect of the knack that we're given, we should be able to see some reduction in systemic markers of oxidative stress that would, that would at least demonstrate that the drug is doing what you know, what we, what we want it to do, but I'm not sure it would tell us what's really happening at the tissue level that we're interested in. That is correct. But do I get to, uh, do I hear you correctly that your changes in the ratio in the aqueous correlate with the concentration of NAC that you were able to measure? Yeah. So there was an inverse I'd like correlation? To, I'd like to be able to answer that, but unfortunately, we, um, due to technical problems, we did not get, uh, we were not able to do the levels for the first two cohorts. So we only have them for Got the it. third cohort. And okay. so we know with that level that we're moving forward with, we see it, but we don't know if it's with the, the lesser levels. Thank you. All right, let's go to Hossein Ameri. Uh, he has still a question. Hi, Peter. That was a wonderful talk. Thank you. Uh, you know, my question is that I was wondering if you uh, use Goldman visual field in these patients to see if there's any changes with the treatment or not. Yeah, so that's a, you know, finding the right outcome measures is really challenging in RP. And, uh, you know, we have tried Octopus and Goldman and things like that. And the problem is that um, it's, it's much more time intensive. It's technically more challenging. And we find for a clinical trial um, setting that the microperimetry provides us with the sort of information we need with the lowest burden on the patients and the coordinators. And that's why we've settled on that. And particularly when you're going to expand to you know, a pretty large scale trial We've gotten input from a lot of, of retinal degeneration specialists, and you know they use all those different types of visual field modalities. But it was pretty much universal that for a large clinical trial, you want to stick with the microperimetry. And um, that that makes sense, you know what you're saying. Uh, you just uh, it, did you happen to do in any case? Because you would think that. The changes in visual field, uh, you know, would be more dramatic uh, compared to when we do uh, microperimetry in terms of, especially subjectively. Um, but did you ever do in any case as a as a just you know preliminary thing to see what happened or? No. No. Okay. Thank you. All right. So, do we have Grazina and Diana online? Yes, I'm here. Yes, we're here. 
Okay, so again, uh, I think I speak for everyone. Thank you very much for what you have done this series. And this week, really, this was phenomenal. And we owe you a great uh, thanks and gratitude for what you have done. Uh, I have one more announcement. Next week, we have two me doctors, MD, PhD graduating. Diana will send you the link. Uh, those really were fantastic students. And uh, if you have anything else to do instead of smoking, drinking, and dancing, uh, please join us for a few minutes. Uh, you will see a very well um, uh, trained and uh, fantastic scientist of the next generation. So Diana, please send to everyone. And I know you're waiting for the final words from Kathy uh, about the seminars and about today's seminar. Anything else that come to Kathy mind? Kathy? Oh, you are brutal. <laughs> very honored. Thank you very much. Um, Peter, that was a great talk. I had a very quick question and then a comment. Um, in the, would you expect any difference in the, um, the, in the treatments in the patients you have that would be age-related for it to work, for example, better in the younger patients, sort of, I guess, dependent on the gene defect? But I, I know you can't go very young, but would you expect there to be an, an, an age-related effect? So, uh, I Kathy, I think that, uh, you know, as far as what we can measure, um, there does seem to be benefit in a, a um, bigger easy width. Um, as far as going earlier on, I mean, I could give, you know, theoretical reasons why, you know, the oxidative stress would be less and that it would be, you know, better. But in order to measure differences, it becomes challenging. So, you know, I think that uh, for the context of a clinical trial, we have to have a fairly narrow window of disease progression in which to, to make our measurements so that we have as homogeneous a population as possible. Um, and, you know, but for the future, I think that if we can demonstrate a, um, a benefit, then, you know, we'd certainly want to expand to earlier in the disease. Now to address your other, what you implied otherwise, um, one of the things that we hope to do in this trial is to, you know, collect a lot of genotype information. You know, not only what's already been done in these patients, but expand on it and try to you know, identify patients, you know, the, the genotype in patients where it's not yet characterized. And we hope to do secondary analysis to, to see if there are particular genotypes in which the treatment might be more beneficial. Um, and so, you know, and of course, we'll, we'll be looking at all baseline characteristics, including age and any other demographic characteristics that we can identify to see if we can find you know, particular populations in which the, the treatment is either particularly beneficial or not so beneficial. So I think that's an important question. It's one that you know, we just haven't yet addressed. Yeah, this is great. Well, as the person who gets to be the final commenter, I think everyone would agree with me that it is worth not only thanking Grazia and uh, but also to make a, a you know, a, to shout out to Chris uh, to, for keeping us abreast of all the best vision scientists over this last year and we science and we really appreciate it and thank you Chris. <laughs> Hello, <laughs> I'm done. <laughs> all right, <laughs> see you on uh, September 17, King Waiyao. We'll tell you right. everything about electrodes, currents and everything else. Okay, thanks everybody. Great to see you. Thanks again. Thank you.